Hello and good morning friends welcome to the CEC Edusat live lecture dear friends we are pleased to announce that uh, we have completed a number of uh, lectures under the series uh, history of uh, english literature dear friends in this session today we would be talking on the age of johnson in the first half uh, we would be discussing on the lawgiver johnson the lawgiver and in the second half we would be discussing on the age of prose and for this we have once again within our studio professor bheem singh dahia professor bheem singh dahia is a, an uh, eminent academician a renowned academician who have uh, students in india and abroad uh, he is the author of book new history of uh, english literature these days uh, he has been the faculty in the various universities and colleges students love him for the content he used to deliver so dear friends let's welcome our guest professor bheem singh dahia under whose able guidance we would be discussing on the age of johnson hello sir welcome to the adset lecture thank you well in this lecture we shall discuss the age of johnson johnson the lawgiver well johnson comes in the later part of the 18th century the earlier 18th century is generally called the age of pope alexander pope uh, he was the dominant poet and of course uh, a literary critic theorist like dryden so the new classical period in english poetry began with uh, john dryden in the 17th century and it ends with dr johnson at the end of the 18th century so in a way these two centuries 17th and 18th they were the centuries for neo classical uh, literature imitations of the classical which was greek or roman literature of the ancient times so imitation of that because during this period of two centuries the writers believed that the best rules for making literature for creating literature were framed and given by the ancient authorities in particular aristotle and of course horace uh they were more uh attracted to horace because horace wrote ars poetica a poem but a law giving poem where you have do's and don'ts as a poet you do this and do not do that similarly johnson and before him pope and before him dryden they followed the same line classical line that is why they are called neo classical means similar to the classical and they also wrote poems following the same manner of writing the manner is law giving so johnson uh, wrote first of course the satire because primarily besides law giving the century is known for the satirical poetry dryden started it macflecknow absalom and achitophel then pope the rape of the lock the dunciad these famous satires or satirical poems uh came before johnson came on the stage so johnson had his own contribution to make to the satirical poetry but there is a difference between johnson's satire and the 
satire uh, written by Dryden and Pope. The difference is that while Dryden and Pope were more inspired and instigated and uh, uh, triggered by personal rivalries with the fellow poets. So, they were just pulling uh, the legs of their rivals. They were trying to undermine their status as poets. So, mostly it were these kind of poems. But Johnson does not do that. He rises above the personal rivalry and writes about the age, is, age in general. That is why he is considered more of a lawgiver. Do this, do not do that. It is this tone, this manner and this subject which informs Johnson's poetry. And the major poem that he wrote, a very long poem, is a vanity of human wishes. The vanity of human wishes. Humans have all sorts of wishes. Somebody wants to do this, somebody wants to do that, and there is no end to wishes. What Johnson tries to show is that what do the wishes finally come to? They end in nothingness because nothingness is the end of life and therefore everything goes into that nothingness. So what kind of vanity? You think you are the ruler of the earth? So that's why he picks up characters who were rulers or important people in the ruling circles, who thought no end of themselves, who were full of themselves, like Ulze was, and wrote about them. So in this uh, vanity of human wishes, his major poem, uh, we find uh, these portraits also. Besides the general uh, weaknesses of mankind, the general temptations of mankind, the general aspirations of mankind, which finally come to nothing, uh, we also have for illustration, for example, the portraits of certain people who are the best examples of the vanity uh, of human wishes. Human wishes coming finally to nothing. So that is uh, uh, his major poem, uh, The Vanity of Human Wishes. Johnson's years were 1709 to 1784. He was born in 1709, beginning of the century. But by the time he comes of age, it is already the middle of the century. And uh, until then, it is the dominance of Pope. Pope was the ruling deity in English poetry and climactic uh, uh, poet of the neoclassical form of poetry, style of poetry. So, after that, Johnson brings about a change. That is why his age is called the age of reason, not the neoclassical age as such which stayed between Dryden and Pope almost a century and a half. But this later part of the 18th century, 
is called the age of reason because rather than write an imitation of the classics or rather than pull down your rivals in terms of personal likes and dislikes what johnson did was that no such thing nothing personal all general all impersonal and the basis is neither likes nor dislikes neither preferences nor prejudices but reason whatever stands to reason is worth admiration is worth the praise and whatever does not stand to reason whatever violates the reason or norms of reason that comes under criticism and that is to be rejected discarded disliked despised depending upon uh, the degree of wrong or deviation from the norm a thing has so it is this kind of poem which is a vanity of human wishes uh this poem came out right in the middle of the century 1749 and as i said besides the general instructions and general do's and don'ts it has a set of portraits for illustrating that vanity and the best piece and best portrait for this uh he chooses is that of thomas woolsey thomas woolsey was the prime minister at the time and he was very powerful he was more powerful than the king and he held all the three departments or portfolios of the state head of religion head of administration and head of the forces so all powerful but then this power depends upon the good will of the king the moment the king's eyes turn away from him he is reduced to nothingness reduced to zero so this is what johnson wants to show after all uh, what is this pomp and show of power it's on a very flimsy ground which can change with the change of uh, eyes the moment the source of power turns his eyes a little away from you then you are mr nobody nobody cares for you this is what precisely had happened with thomas woolsey and see how johnson describes uh in full blown dignity see woolsey stand in full blown with dignity see woolsey stand law in his voice and fortune in his hand so head of both head of law and head of religion law in his voice and fortune in his hand to him the church the realm their powers consign so the state as well as religion both were in his pocket so to say through him the rays of regal bounty shine so much so 
that even the king, you see, his authority, his regal status shines through his secretary, Wulze, prime minister. He was so powerful. Means king had no direct impact on the public. It had to be through the agency of Wulze. So uh, that is why uh, Johnson says, to him the church, the realm, their powers consign. Through him the rays of regal bounty shine. Turned by his nod, the stream of honor flows. His smile alone, security bestows. So, just his eyes and smile, his lips, they can make a difference. If his eyes turn away from you, you are reduced to nothingness. If he smiles at you, the fortune smiles at you. You become the most powerful man in the state. So it was this kind of power that he enjoyed, more powerful than the king and holding the reins of power of all the three agencies, administration, religion and uh, politics. Still to new heights, his restless wishes tower. Despite all this, despite the fact that he is all powerful, he is not yet satisfied. He still has higher ambition. He still has wishes for climbing more steps towards greater heights. What Johnson is trying to say is that there is no end to human ambition, to human wishes. If you fulfill one, you last for another. If you fulfill that, then the next one. So never ending process of wishing goes on with man unless he meets his end, his death. So still to new heights, his restless wishes tower. Claim leads to claim and power advances power till conquest unresisted cease to please. Till conquest unresisted cease to please and right submitted left him none to seize. So this goes on unless there is nothing left to conquer. There is nothing left to wish for. So until then man goes on and on and on which means until you meet the end. So this is the vanity of human wishes. After all, for whom? Life is limited. It has to come to an end. So what are these wishes for? It is all vanity. That is what the poem is about. Of course, Johnson was not a very great poet. He was a great thinker. He was a lawgiver. He would be best telling you what to do and what not to do. So a giant among the writers, giant among the thinkers of his age. But so far as the quality of poetry is concerned, the excellence of his verse is concerned, it's not really great. Dryden and Pope were much greater poets. They may not be as great thinkers as Johnson was, but they were certainly great poets. 
and that is why uh, they are red, their points are still red, are very popular. Uh, Johnson hardly. Johnson stays today more as a prose writer, uh, a mind which is respected for its ideas. That is why rather than his poems, in fact just a poem, Vanity of Human Wishes uh, more or less, uh, it is his lives of the poets. The second important thing that he had written and in fact which became the first important one, which has last longer, which is still in demand is his book Lives of the Poets. So, all the poets in English from Chaucer to Pope, he had written the lives of all these poets, means brief sketches, brief biographies about their life, about their personality, about their work whatever they produced. So, covering all these aspects of one's life and letters, he wrote this book which still continues to be a popular one because he has his own style of writing uh, which is very interesting, uh, witty also and then of course, uh, intelligent as he was, sharp as he was he could go into the very depth of uh, the personality, the soul of the poet and the soul of poetry also. So, it is this which still keeps him relevant, may not be vanity of human wishes, but his lives they remain in demand and very popular. Well, uh, but then as I said, poetry as such does not have qualities of great verse, not like Dryden and Pope or even Chaucer, leave aside Shakespeare and Marlowe. Uh, he has nothing to compare with their greatness in verse, but he has his own kind of poetry which is, which is speaking poetry to begin with. Whereas, in the case of Chaucer, uh, you cannot really say that although Chaucer also made a beginning with uh, the speaking verse, but then here it is more direct and more close to prose. So, close to everyday speech, even the vocabulary, the, the diction that he uses, phrases, then sentence construction, all that comes very close to everyday speech. Whereas, in the earlier poets, Chaucer or Dryden, or Pope, you find that there is uh, a visible difference between the everyday speech and the language of their poetry. But here, that difference is narrowed down to the minimal, is almost eliminated, and you do not really see much difference between what you hear in the street and what you read here on the page. But then another quality of uh, this poetry of Johnson is the, the wit, because from Dryden onward right up to the end of the 18th century, the age of Johnson, uh, wit dominated. Of course, metaphysicals are called 
uh, the poets of wit. But then uh, wit was not absent in this poetry between Dryden and Johnson. It was very much there. The only thing is that it was overshadowed by uh, the, the, the satire, because satire became more popular, more pungent, more powerful than the wit. And obviously, common man cannot appreciate the subtle wit, the subtle wit only the initiated ones, uh, either the poets themselves or, or the, the interpreters and teachers of poetry, only they can pre appreciate. But here was something which even the common people, common people could follow and appreciate. So that made a difference and that made it more uh, popular, closer to the ground, closer to every everyday life and closer to uh, common people, their taste. So vanity of human wishes cater to all this and comes up to the expectations of the common people. And no wonder it continues to be popular even today. So uh, I think enough for the subject uh, to conclude the age of Johnson uh, may be the end of neoclassical poetry, but it had its own laurels, it had its own virtues and some of them even greater than what uh, Dryden or Pope had in their poems. Thank you. Well, in the present lecture, we shall be discussing the age of prose, which again means later part of the 18th century, the same old, the age of Johnson. So with the poetry of the neoclassical mode and model, reaching its culmination in Pope and coming to a close in the poetry of Dr. Johnson. With the decline of this, there came about the rise of prose. Not that the prose was not there in English literature before that. Prose had been there right from the beginning in a way, right from the time English poetry began, age of Chaucer for example. But then the prose 
we are talking about and why later 18th century is called the age of prose that formally for the first time essay writing as a regular form of address to the people this came in vogue for the first time so what we call periodical which was not there before periodical is a regular publication weekly fortnightly monthly so it is this prose the periodical writing of essays this came about in the age of johnson and this was the prose counterpart of the new classical poetry because in new classical poetry also the subject of uh, the poets or the poems was a general critique of contemporary society its morals and manners its ways of living earning etc or even ruling so that very function of poetry now is equally and maybe more effectively done by the writers of these periodicals in prose because uh, this had greater access greater popularity following the idiom of uh, the people's everyday talk their conversations this was accessible to everybody in public poetry is not poetry has its subtleties poetry has meter rhyme wit in directions symbol myth so on and so forth irony satire so many things all that cannot be easily perceived by the common reader but then the direct sort of address in prose and speaking in the language of every day sort that makes it much more accessible hence the periodicals in the later 18th century they immediately became popular and to the disadvantage of poetry because poetry had a setback people would like to read this so poetry's readership became limited it got restricted to the very initiated sophisticated cultured uh, audience it is only they people of culture people of taste the initiated readers who would uh, read poetry at leisure the rest of the public they would rather read periodicals and wait for them so this was the beginning of the periodicals so the age of prose in that sense for the first time the regular periodicals weekly publications begin and the two name famous for this are edison and steel thomas edison and richard steel they are always mentioned together they work together they brought out common periodicals so it was a team of writers it was a great 
collaboration of great minds and minds that had flair for writing, a flair for style, a manner of writing full of wit, full of interest, full of humor. So that is why uh, Edison and Steele made uh, the uh, made the periodicals very popular. Joseph Edison's years are 1672 to 1719. So even before Johnson, this was early uh, uh, early 18th century. He died in 1719. And uh, Richardson, 1672, 1729, 10 years later. So, roughly uh, the first 30 years of the 18th century much before Dr. Johnson's age, these prose writers, they made a mark and they uh, brought out weekly publications under different heads because they realized that after some time, a periodical will uh, reach its tethers and for one reason or another, it could not be sustained forever. Therefore, to keep it up, they would change the name and start a new one. People would think there is something new come and therefore, it had its own run. So, in this sequence, Edison and Steele came out with several periodicals. For example, they uh, begin with the spectator. The spectator was the first venture they initiated uh, in prose writing, which was by and large commentary on general life of the time what kind of habits, what kind of right or wrong habits people had in the 18th century. So, that critique and it has a great social function. After all, that is how culture is promoted, culture is preserved and values are sustained and morals are maintained. So, uh, it has a great relevance to society, this kind of writing. In fact, even much more relevance than uh, poetry. So, Edison and Steele were pioneers in the periodical written in prose, written in the language of the people. So, the spectator was the first, followed by the guardian, followed by the old wig and still followed by the freeholder and the last which became more popular, the tattler. The spectator the guardian, old wig, the freeholder and the tattler. So, these many periodicals they brought out and as I said, the changing of names was essential because after some time, maybe a few months, maybe a few years, people somehow uh, reach the end of their interest or they start losing interest in 
a particular periodical. So to give it new life, new lease of life, to sustain its continuance, uh, they thought it wise to change the name. Although the writers are the same, subject matter is more or less the same, but the title changes and that arouses people's curiosity. Of course, uh, it is always a policy to add one or two things new because it can't be just uh, a verbatim replica of the earlier one. If it is that, then people would say, oh, it is just a change of name. Therefore, to give it a new look, you have to add and you have also to drop a few things. So that is what Edison and Steele were doing. They begin with the spectator, then they came out with the new one, the guardian and still new one, old wig and another, the freeholder and finally the tattler. As I said, the tattler became the most popular. Either the first one was the spectator or the last one, the tattler. These two made a mark and these two gave uh, value and status to both the writers uh, who were always remembered as uh, twins, as a team, never alone. Nobody would speak of uh, Edison and Steele separately. They were always, you see, mentioned together, Edison and Steele, as if it was a sort of company, which in writing, of course, they were. In the world of letters, it was no less than a company. So, in this uh, uh, age of prose, so to say, which began with these periodicals, then greater form of prose rose, which was the novel, because novel also came up in the 18th century, more so in the later part. Of course, it had started emerging right with the time of the periodical. And finally, it is the novel which sustained itself and became a seminal work which emerged as a tradition. Prose, of, of course, also continued. We have prose during the 19th century also the romantic prose, then the Victorian prose, and later still the 20th century, the modern prose, and then after World War II, the postmodern. Not that it went out of vogue, but its rival, the parallel growth of the novel, that came up more strongly and became more popular because that has fiction, that has stories. Here there are no stories. If there are little anecdotes, but in the novel you have interesting tales and tales which you can keep on reading for days together. So, pastime, mornings, evenings, whenever you have free time, you can go back to your novel and resume the story. So, that interest is maintained by uh, the longer fiction, 
which is not the case with the shorter ones. Shorter ones, one sitting, and not the sustained uh, uh, plot, a chain of incidents. That chain is missing there. Here it's a chain, one thing linked up with the other. And when you come to the end of one, you expect the other to go on and so on. So, novel, which again was uh, uh, the baby of the 18th century. It was uh, born and brought up in the 18th century. So, the two names which are famous as pioneers of the English novel are Richardson and Fielding. Richardson was more of a moral and religious or spiritual kind of writer. Whereas Fielding was more of a social critic, the so more popular, wider range of the subject matter, so obviously. And then satire being at the center of that writing made him much more popular. He began with Joseph Andrews and finally wrote that classic Tom Jones. So, Joseph Andrews and Tom Jones, they overshadowed the novels written by uh, Richardson. Pilgrim's Progress, for example, a very religious sort of novel because you are going on a pilgrimage. So, the interest is limited. Only those who are religiously inclined will be reading that stuff. Whereas, Joseph Andrews and Tom Jones, everybody will be reading lighter stuff, more interesting stuff, lot of humor, lot of satire. Whereas, uh, Richardson's uh, writings, they are humorless. Because when you are writing on a subject of religion, you cannot afford to make fun. There is no scope for any lighter matter there. So, nothing uh, uh, flippant, nothing uh, ridiculous or humorous or satirical or even witty. So, all these aspects of writing, they have to be curbed and in fact eased out of the canon. So, Fielding had that advantage. He took to writing popular kind of novel and that is why he is called the father of the English novel, not Richardson. Although Richardson wrote Pamela, Mall Flanders. Pamela, in fact, because of its being a very, very religious sort of book, came under attack from Fielding. Fielding wrote uh, a parody of it, ridiculing the subject of Pamela, and he named it deliberately Shamela, sort of shame on whatever Pamela is. So, he wrote a parody of Pamela as Shamela. It may not be not be in good taste. It may not be a great writing, but it only indicates uh, the writer's stance, that he stands for 
popular things, common things, lighter things, and not for damned serious and humorless of not much interest to the common pers- people. So Fielding rightly called the father of the English novel. And uh, these two novels, uh, Joseph Andrews and uh, uh, Tom Jones, they have a similar format. The form is what came to be known as Picaresque novel, Picaresque, that is uh, an extension of or uh, mm, a formation, a further modification of the Picaro. It is it's a derivative, derivative from Picaro. Picaro is unheroic hero, the protagonist of the novel who is antithesis of the heroic character of the epic. They were the long poems or heroic poems. So as a counterpart to that, comic counterpart, that was serious writing, here you have comic writing. That was poetry of the higher order, here you have prose of the lower order, where you have humor, satire, comedy, entertainment. So, uh, Fielding excelled in that and he wrote these picaresque novels. In the picaresque novel, it is a journey novel. The model for all these was the first novel called Robinson Crusoe. That was the model. And uh, the novel as it began in the 17th century, uh, Spain, Spanish. So even the word Picaro is Spanish. So Picaro is the anti-hero, a comic counterpart of the heroic character of the epic hero. So uh, Fielding excelled in that. First he created Joseph Andrews who goes out on a journey and runs into all sorts of comic ridiculous episodes. Uh, sometimes mm, even uh, uh, episodes of very low level. That is a problem with humorous writing. They do not keep limits and Fielding could do that. Fielding would indulge in a very low type of comedy also, sometimes bordering the vulgar, which Richardson would not do. Richardson is humorless. That is another extreme. This extreme is that no holds bar. So that is why Joseph Andrews has all kinds of episodes. And Tom Jones, still greater variety. Of course, it just as a better novel, almost a classic. But the format is the same, the ingredients are the same, the devices used of irony, satire, humor are the same. So this prose writing of the 18th century is a perfect counterpart of the 18th century satirical poetry, which started with Dryden ended with Johnson. So in the age of Johnson, you find the culmination as well as a sort of ending, a dismemberment or disappearance of these two traditions. Novel of course 
is something new that emerges in the 18th century and which is still continuing. Of course, periodical essay is also continuing, but novel as I said became more predominant, more popular and more prestigious as the time went by. And uh, uh, that is why uh, it uh, enjoys greater prestige even today. I think with this uh, we will conclude uh, this lecture on uh, the age of Johnson uh, in two phases in a way, the poetic phase and the prose phase. So you have both great faces, poetry and prose, and prose periodical as well as fictional novel. So you have all this in the 18th century, and that is why 18th century has great importance in the history of English literature, because you cannot bypass it. You cannot overlook it. It made great contributions to both poetry, prose and fiction, another part of prose. Thank you. With this note, thank you sir. Thank you so very much uh, for uh, giving us a very, very vivacious session once again. Dear friends, we believe that uh, you might have liked this lecture. If you want to give your feedback regarding this particular lecture, if you want to ask any question uh, or if you want to have uh, any uh, session on any of the topics uh, which you would <coughs> be suggesting, then you can mail us info.cc at the rate nic.in. Uh, very soon we would be uploading this lecture on YouTube for you so that it becomes easier for you to see the lectures a number of times you wanted. Afterwards also if you feel that uh, some point you have missed out or, or uh, some queries uh, you want to uh, give to us, you can definitely mail us uh, and uh, uh, we would be uh, uploading this lecture on YouTube as I already said. We would be meeting again tomorrow and uh, would be uh, discussing on the pre-romantics of uh, Blake. So, with this note, I would like to thank uh, Professor Bhim Singh Dahiya once again for his uh, precious time as well as the uh, precious content he has given to the EduSet lectures. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you thank so very you. much.